Welcome to the second session of the ICU curriculum. In this session, we will cover IV access, central venous catheters, and endotracheal tubes. Our objectives for the session are Describe how Poisset's law explains the difference in infusion speed and volume between peripheral IV, triple lumen, and introducer sheath catheters. Identify triple lumen, introducer sheath, and dialysis catheters. Identify common indications for central venous access, and identify complications of endotracheal intubation. Let's start with the case. You're admitting a patient with an upper GI bleed to the medical ICU. As you arrive at the room for your initial evaluation, the nurse tells you that the patient has no IV access. The nurse tells you that there are supplies for an 18-gauge peripheral IV, a triple lumen, and an introducer sheath catheter. The nurse asks which line you would prefer. Decisions regarding IV access are made daily in the ICU. The right type of IV access depends on a number of factors, including the patient, their disease process, and their overall level of illness. In addition, whether we know it or not, when we think about IV access, we are also considering an important principle of fluid dynamics, Poisset's Law. Poisset's Law describes laminar flow through straight circular tubes. In the equation for Poisset's Law, Q equals flow rate, P equals pressure, R equals radius, N equals fluid viscosity, and L is the length of the tubing. Note that radius is in the numerator, and length of tubing is in the denominator. Therefore, Poisset's law states that the larger the radius and shorter the length of a tube, the greater the flow. Clinically, this means that shorter and wider lines allow for faster and larger volume infusions. How do you know whether an IV or a catheter is wider? For peripheral IVs, the lower the gauge size, the wider the diameter. For example, a 16 gauge is larger than a 20 gauge. For catheters, the higher the French size, the wider the diameter. For example, a 12 French is larger than a 7 French. If a patient already has a peripheral IV and you are unsure of the size, all peripheral IVs are color coded based on their gauge. 14 gauge IVs are orange, 16 gauges are gray, 18 gauges are green, 20 gauges are pink, and 22 gauges are blue. Poisset's law explains why a 16 or 18 gauge peripheral IV is an excellent choice in almost all patients for initial resuscitation. Because these IVs are relatively wide, very short, and easily placed. But what if your patient needs more than just a peripheral IV? How do you choose the right type of central venous catheter? There are three main types of central venous catheters or central lines. Triple lumens, introducer sheaths, and dialysis catheters. The triple lumen is the most commonly utilized central venous catheter in the ICU. It has three separate lumens or ports for medication and fluid administration. Triple lumen catheters are typically 7 to 9 French in diameter and 15 to 20 centimeters in length. Note how much longer the triple lumen catheter is than the typical 18 gauge peripheral IV. Referring back to Poisset's law, that significant difference in length is important because the triple lumen catheter is actually slower infusing than a 16 or 18 gauge peripheral IV. Therefore, a 16 or 18 gauge IV is preferred for rapid volume infusions. Another common central venous catheter is the introducer sheath. At our hospitals, the introducer sheath is commonly referred to by its brand name, Cordis. An introducer sheath is a large bore, single lumen line. It is typically 7 to 9 French and approximately 10 centimeters in length. Because of the larger width and shorter length, the introducer sheath allows for the most rapid fluid and blood product administration of all types of catheters or IVs. It is better in this regard than a 16 or 18 gauge peripheral IV. Therefore, the introducer sheath is utilized for patients with hemorrhagic shock where large volumes of blood need to be administered rapidly. In addition, an introducer sheath is wide enough that pacing wires, pulmonary artery catheters, and even triple lumen catheters can be introduced or inserted through it. Therefore, an introducer sheath may also be utilized for patients with heart block that need temporary pacing or cardiogenic shock if a pulmonary artery catheter is required. Finally, dialysis catheters. At our hospitals, dialysis catheters are commonly referred to by the brand name Maherker. A dialysis catheter is a large bore, double lumen central line. Dialysis catheters are typically 12 French and 15 to 20 centimeters in length. Therefore, dialysis catheters are wider than either the triple lumen or the introducer sheath because the catheter needs to be able to move large volumes of blood between the patient and the dialysis machine. Now that we have discussed the characteristics of each of these lines, what are the specific indications for placing a central venous catheter? The most common indication for placing a central venous catheter is shock requiring vasopressor infusion. Vasopressors require a central venous catheter due to concern for peripheral extravasation when administered through a peripheral IV for extended periods of time. 
Extravasation of a vasopressor can cause vasoconstriction and skin necrosis. The triple lumen is the preferred choice for patients with shock requiring vasopressor support. Other common indications for placing a central venous catheter include hemorrhagic shock requiring large volume resuscitation of blood products, an instance where an introducer sheath is most appropriate, acute renal failure requiring renal replacement therapy, an instance where a dialysis catheter is most appropriate, heart block requiring transvenous cardiac pacing, where an introducer sheath is required in order to insert the pacing wire, and apheresis, for example plasmapheresis, where a dialysis catheter is required. We've evaluated the patient, determined their indication for a central venous catheter, and chosen the type of catheter that we want to place. Now, where can we place the line? Central venous catheters can be placed into three main locations across the body. The most common location is the right internal jugular vein or the left internal jugular vein. If possible, the right internal jugular vein is typically preferred because it provides a straight shot to the heart and has a relatively low rate of placement complications. In addition, a central venous catheter can also be placed into the right and left subclavian and the right and left femoral veins. If the line is placed into the internal jugular or subclavian veins, the ideal location for the distal tip of the catheter is at the cavoatrial junction, the junction between the right atrium and superior vena cava. As we are placing the catheter, what are some possible complications to be aware of? The internal jugular vein and internal carotid artery run in close proximity in the neck, as do the subclavian vein and artery and femoral vein and artery in their respective parts of the body. Depending on patient positioning, the internal carotid may lie just beneath the internal jugular. Therefore, there is always a risk of arterial puncture and bleeding when placing a central venous catheter. Ultrasound is used to visualize the target vessel, needle entry, and wire placement which minimizes the risk of hitting another vascular structure. Second, anytime a needle is being directed into or towards the chest, as is the case during an internal jugular or subclavian line placement, there is also a risk of causing a pneumothorax. This x-ray demonstrates a large right-sided pneumothorax after placement of a dialysis catheter into the right internal jugular. A post-procedure chest x-ray is completed to evaluate for pneumothorax and to determine distal catheter tip location. Finally, the image demonstrates gram-positive cocci and clusters, characteristic of Staph aureus, a frequent cause of central line-associated bloodstream infections or clabsies. To prevent clabsies, central lines are placed under sterile precautions using gowns, gloves, and masks. At this point, we've discussed how Poisset's law defines many of the IV and catheter decisions we make within the ICU, discussed the various types of central venous catheters, and reviewed indications, placement locations, and complications. We are going to end this session by discussing another procedure common in the ICU, endotracheal intubation. Endotracheal intubation is performed when patients require invasive mechanical ventilation. The endotracheal tube then becomes the connection between the patient and the ventilator. The endotracheal tube is placed via direct or video laryngoscopy. In direct laryngoscopy, the patient is intubated with the operator directly visualizing the vocal cords and then passing the endotracheal tube through the cords. In video laryngoscopy, the blade is equipped with a camera that allows the operator to look at the airway on a small monitor placed next to the bed. Once successfully placed, what are the various parts of the endotracheal tube that allow it to function as intended? Endotracheal tube size is determined by the internal diameter of the tube. The typical internal diameter for most endotracheal tubes used in adult patients is 7 to 8 millimeters. When an attending, fellow, or respiratory therapist refers to a tube being a 7 or an 8, they are referencing the internal diameter measure. There are multiple parts to an endotracheal tube. The most proximal part is the connection between the endotracheal tube and the mechanical ventilator tubing. Moving down, endotracheal tubes have multiple depth markings to show how many centimeters deep the tube has been inserted. Further down is the cuff, shown currently inflated. Following intubation, the cuff is inflated to seal the airway. This seal allows for controlled ventilation and oxygenation as it creates a closed circuit between the ventilator and the patient. In addition, an inflated cuff is also designed to prevent passage of fluid, secretions, or other material down into the lung. The cuff is inflated via tubing that runs through the pilot balloon. The pilot balloon is designed to be an external marker of whether the cuff is inflated or deflated. The pilot balloon sits outside the patient, and when the pilot balloon is inflated, the cuff is inflated, and vice versa. At the distal end of the endotracheal tube is the main opening through which oxygen is delivered to the patient. Just proximal to the main opening is Murphy's eye. Designed by and named for a prominent anesthesiologist, Francis Murphy, Murphy's eye is a hole on the side of the ETT that allows for ongoing ventilation even if the main opening becomes occluded. Once placed, the ideal location of the tip of the endotracheal tube is 2 to 3 centimeters above the carina. What are some major complications of endotracheal intubation?
Intubation is an invasive procedure that can have severe hemodynamic effects. During intubation, patients may become hemodynamically unstable. In addition, patients that are already hemodynamically unstable and undergoing intubation are at higher risk for cardiac arrest. Additional complications include right main stem intubation because the right main stem is a straighter shot due to its more vertical orientation, and esophageal intubation. Right main stem and esophageal intubation are assessed for by listening for bilateral breath sounds and looking for color change on a colorimetric end tidal carbon dioxide detector. The detector assesses for return of carbon dioxide in the endotracheal tube, which can only occur if the tube is in the airways. Most end tidal CO2 detectors will turn a shade of yellow if carbon dioxide is detected returning through the endotracheal tube. This confirms the tube is in the airway. Other complications of intubation include aspiration of gastric contents and oral and airway trauma. This chest x-ray demonstrates multiple lines and tubes. Take a second and see if you can identify all of the lines and tubes in this image. This x-ray depicts an endotracheal tube, a dialysis catheter or meherker in the right internal jugular, a triple lumen catheter in the left internal jugular, and an orogastric tube in the stomach. Note that the dialysis catheter is wider than the triple lumen. In summary, in this session we described how Poisset's law explains the difference in infusion speed and volume between peripheral IV, triple lumen, and introducer sheath catheters, identified triple lumen, introducer sheath, and dialysis catheters, identified common indications for central venous access, and finally, characteristics of endotracheal tubes and complications of endotracheal intubation. Thank you for your participation.